I mean, one of the things that I have to do for everyone on the podcast is to break down the reading list, right? I mean, it's just got to be done so people can go and follow up on what we've talked about. And I know, I know we do that in all of our classes as well. Um, and I'm going to list a, a number of the books that we talked about here, but you've also mentioned a number of secondary sources. Do, do you want to rattle them off and I can then put them on the, the show notes? There are so many uh, complex works, in dense works, but some of them I've written in Du Bois Studies, by the way. Let me, let me just go ahead and be self-effacing. Uh, and I realized that and when, an, 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 when a high schooler or, or an undergraduate student comes to me and say, listen, Dr. Baca, I've heard all of this buzz about Du Bois. Where do I start? Beyond the primary sources of the souls of black folk, the Philadelphia Negro, Dark Water, John Brown, so on and so forth. But what about commentary that is accessible, that is critical, that is pitched, right? At an undergraduate, undergraduate audience, can you think of it? We do not have an introduction. We got so many introductions to Foucault, so many introductions to Habermas, to Marx, to Kristeva, to, you know, Sartre, right? And so on and so on, Gramsci, right? But what about Du Bois? That's what I set out to do to give the greatest hits. What is it the main things that you need to know about Du Bois? So to help you with your list, if you look at the way the book is structured, certainly my bibliography, but those for me are some of the core works that I think would be good to share with people just starting, just scratching the surface about Du Bois. All right. Well, that's a that's a great help, I think, for everyone. And I think you're right there. You know, as an intellectual, he's not unpicked enough as a person, as a human being. There's a lot of biographies out there, but that doesn't get to that intellectual thought that you that's what you, you've you really gotten to in your work. Um, there's one other question that I ask everyone as well. Um, and, and that's if there's any object in this period that makes that, that, that you think symbolizes or encapsulates the Gilded Age progressive era, if there was one object, and it's a hard question sometimes for people to think about because we don't often think about material culture, but you being such an interdisciplinary scholar, I wonder if you had any ideas of an object that could uh, symbolize the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. When you say an object, am I able to you? Because I'm a geek. Again, I'm a bibliophile. I have over 12,000 books here. So, you know, forgive me. Or could it be a the cover of one of the crisis magazines? Is that like that's material, visual and material. You do know in my lectures, this is how I use on my PowerPoints. I start them out with the crisis cover because I think that that's where we see Du Bois's evolution. I don't think that we we expose our students enough to African American intellectual culture, African American intellectual traditions. And I think I don't know if we would have intersectionality. I don't think we would have intersectional intersectionality right now without that tradition. It is so. See, as a jazz musician, the way they taught me was the dialectic of tradition and innovation. You have to know the tradition in order to innovate on the tradition. That is the reason Coleman Hawkins does not sound like John Coltrane and Dexter Gordon does not sound like Sonny Stitt and Billie Holiday does not sound necessarily like Nina Simone and so on and so forth. So tradition and innovation, Du Bois is one of those figures who dances with that dialectic that he grounded himself in not simply in European and European American intellectual traditions, but he was deeply and profoundly, profoundly grounded in black intellectual traditions. So for me, the Crisis Magazine is proof positive. It leaves a, a visual and textual record of how deeply, you know, this thing of a Pan-African idea, he actualized it via the crisis, right? Among, I mean, he had all those Pan-African uh, 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 conferences and everything. And so for me, I can think of covers of the Crisis Magazine Certainly, I can think of a lot of the work coming out of the Harlem Renaissance where Elaine Locke is pushing back to a certain extent against the notion of primitivism being, you know, what we call Afro-modernism. Some of the highbrow, you know, uh, art critics were saying, oh, look at the, look at the uh, uh, primitivism that's going on. And then another thing, I teach a course on the Harlem Renaissance. I actually look at the parallels and the missed opportunity between the Harlem Renaissance and the lost generation. Full disclosure, I'm a geek. So Gertrude Stein, Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, I could do this all day. I read them just as deeply as I did the Harlem, Langston Hughes and Zona Hurston and Conti Cullen and Claude McKay. And I think there was something very rich going on artistically, I guess cultural arts movements during this time period. So 
you kind of asked me the wrong question if you haven't noticed because there's so many. But if we're talking about Du Bois, the crisis, you know, the way that he would put children, the way that he would feature African American women uh, on there, the way that he would feature uh, working class, sometimes even African American, on the cover of the crisis. Raylan, thanks so much. I know listeners will agree that's a provocative image uh, and a really useful object for us to dissect African-American thought and culture in the early 20th century.